All right. So welcome everyone. And we will be sharing it with all the folks who have registered who couldn't make it. Um, okay, so just trying to make sure, yes. And for half, you might pause me based on what folks might be saying. So keep an eye on the chat. Um, so yeah, our focus is talking about ADHD, uh, not just the hyperactive ADHD, but also ADD component, um, and also some of the comorbid conditions, anxiety, depression, bipolar, we'll just touch on them a little bit, but a lot of focus will be on. Um, ADT, do we have a question as your session at the very end? Uh, yes, and I will pause in the middle as well. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, so the workshop, basically, this webinar is designed to empower individuals who might have uh, ADHD, their caretakers, if you're a parent, uh, your loved ones, or if you're a professional working in the field, so a lot of uh, nuggets of information. Um, and the purpose is so that we can take control of our lives, so de-stigmatizing the diagnosis and finding ways to improve our daily functioning. And this work is heavily influenced by my training with Dr. Russell Barkley. So Barkley's model is, um, you know, gold standard of ADHD treatment and Dr. Edward Hallowell's work in this field as well. And both are uh, psychiatrists, so MDs. And before we begin, housekeeping items, um, keep your mics off. Unless you have a question, you can type it in chat. Um, camera on off however you want to um, you know if you're comfortable you can turn it on if not off is okay you can take notes but we will be sharing these slides uh, afterwards with all the attendees questions keep them coming pop them in the chat as well as you can share the recording with your loved ones all right so what you can expect in next uh, two-ish hours I'll try to keep it short and sweet. So it's all the important components and not all the fluff. You will learn about various treatment options. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about medication, uh, but a lot of focus will be on non-medication ways to manage if this diagnosis is present. So behavioral management components, how do we develop the skills that we need to manage our symptoms effectively? And if you have your individual situation you can you want to discuss, you can book the consults and we can address those uh, as well. So our entire team, team is very comfortable working with this uh, particular you know, disorder, although I hate labels. Um, so we are going to highlight what are some of the comorbid conditions and 60% of the time there is a coexisting um, disorder. My own child has ADHD. His comes with a little bit of sensory processing. So he has SPD, uh, SPD as well. And a lot of folks that I see in my clinical work will sometimes have depression, which is more common uh, with my female clients, especially uh, teens, as well as uh, anxiety, especially now that we are in that phase of going back to school. Uh, that is really huge as well. Challenges typically are organization and time management, that's where there is a struggle. And how do we use some of these strategies that we know can improve the attention and impulse control? So we'll touch on those. And some guidelines to manage social interactions, uh, managing our emotions, and how to build resilience, and how do we cope with stress that comes with having some kind of a mental challenge. And it is um, on a continuum. Some people are able to manage it really well. Some folks struggle. And that's why we come in as a support team to help you navigate this diagnosis. So I'm going to touch on it very briefly what it is in case you're uh, not sure. And you can share it with grandparents who typically tend to disbelieve that there is something called attention deficit. They simply think the child is lazy, needs discipline all the things that we used to hear in 80s and 90s. Um, but there is still a lot of stigma. People don't want to tell anyone that their child is neurodiverse. So, all right. So overview, I see a question. Is there a question? Maximize the PowerPoint. Okay. Not sure how to do that. Uh, maybe slideshow. Yeah. All right. Um, so yeah, we are going to, let's go back. So that's the thing. I don't know how to go back and forth. Now we are going forward. 
Uh, yeah, I'm gonna try going back. Yes, here we are. Okay, just my tabs. Okay, so understanding ADHD, what's the, um, you know, what are some of the symptoms, how we diagnose it, what are com common comorbid, comorbid, comorbid simply means coexisting conditions. Like I said, 60% something else is going to be present. And then quick overview of treatment options. Uh, so basically there is presence of inattention, which again, some experts will disagree. It's like there is too much attention, too many things are catching um, our attention. So inattention would be like a card that cannot start, right? You cannot pay attention. Um, attention deficit is almost like my car is too fast. It's like a race card that doesn't have brakes or the brakes are almost like bicycle brakes. Um, so folks will typically have difficulty paying attention to details. They get easily distracted. Daydreaming is very common. Uh, and there is forgetfulness in daily activities. There is a big component of hyperactivity, but again, we have ADD as well. Hyperactivity component may or may not be present. Um, youth, children, they will typically fidget. They cannot sit still in the class. They cannot wait for their turn. There is excessive talking happening in the class. Um, so it's really good for teachers to know if this diagnosis is there, how they can manage their classrooms. And then there is impulsivity that is acting without thinking. This in our adult life uh, then turns into impulsive activities, uh, thrill seeking, uh, compulsive shopping, compulsive eating, uh, addictive behaviors, uh, interrupting others, having a difficult time maintaining a conversation and difficulty waiting for one's turns. And these symptoms have to be present at least six months before the diagnosis is given. And it should cause significant impairment in at least two settings. So home and school, home and work, home and wherever else you exist, social settings. Um, and a lot of times people think that you can develop ADHD in adulthood and there is a big uh, body of research that is saying, no, that's not the case. If ADHD has to exist, it is typically diagnosed around seven to 12 years of age. These symptoms are already there. Uh, whether someone is paying attention or not, that's a different story. So the diagnostic criteria we use is DSM-5. Inattention, so there is two, two lists. One is inattention list, one is hyperactivity, and there are a lot of things underneath it, lots of questions, and at least six of those things have to be present in both inattention and hyperactivity and impulsivity um, sheet for this diagnosis to be given. And like I said, symptoms have to be present in your childhood, and then the diagnosis is a different story. Um, and they cause clinically significant impairment in social, academic, and occupational functioning. So activities of your daily living are affected because of this diagnosis, because of this condition. Because I think in some capacity, all of us will forget from time to time. Stress can take over uh, or something else is on, on our mind and we are not paying attention in our conversations. And that doesn't necessarily mean that we have ADHD. So we need that formal diagnosis. Um, so it's so important to make sure that ADHD is differentiated from other existing conditions like anxiety, depression, bipolar, and learning disorders. So if there is ADHD, there is also sometimes uh, dyslexia and other learning disorders present. Um, so, so important to have a comprehensive evaluation, which includes a thorough medical, psychological, and educational assessment. Um, Back in the day, we as counselors, as psychotherapists, we were able to diagnose, uh, but like recent changes in uh, medical act here in BC, we cannot uh, diagnose. We can only give our diagnostic impression. Um, registered clinical social workers can. We have Navjot on our team. She can, um, as well as psychologists and psychiatrists can. However, you want to make sure if your GP is giving you this diagnosis that they're not just going by that five minute conversation with you. There is a thorough assessment done and other things are ruled out like trauma and uh, family history has to be taken into account. And someone else besides you as an individual should be uh, part of the assessment uh, process, like your teacher, your colleague, your boss, your one or the other parent. So other people in your life 
uh, need to be part of assessment taking process. All right, moving on. So common existing uh, conditions that also affect ADHD. So along with ADHD, there is anxiety, typically because as a child, I was labeled as lazy. And I know teacher is going to ask me a particular question. And because I'm thinking of something else, I'm bored in the lecture, especially history class, could never pay attention. Um, I'm going to be labeled. She will say, you're not paying attention. I'll be made fun of. Um, so now my anxiety is going to be heightened if I'm going to school. So that's how anxiety starts to, you know, start to coexist with this. When the dopamine levels are less, hyperactivity is missing. Then we see uh, attention deficit along with depression. And if there is an existing condition, for example, say bipolar or dyslexia, more difficult to treat ADHD alone. Um, so more severe symptoms greater the impairment. And again, it exists on a continuum. Some people able to manage it easily, some people more struggles. So comorbid conditions make treatment for ADHD more complex. And there is always this conversation, especially among us psychotherapists. So if there is ADHD existing and depression, should I treat depression first? Should I treat ADHD? Uh, lots of conflicting um, you know, ideas. And as per the experts, Dr. Hallowell, Dr. Barkley, they will always say that it has to be in conjunction. If you are taking medication, doesn't mean that you should not be uh, focusing on non-medication aspects. Or if you decide not to take medication, that's totally okay too. Um, but let's treat all the different aspects together because that will have more success. Um, and again, more complex along with ADHD, other issues, then our treatment effectiveness decreases. And it also increases the risk of non-compliance. Okay, going back, I think I missed something. Okay, so more complex because of more existing conditions and comorbid conditions need to be addressed so that we can improve the overall functioning and quality of life of individuals. So we'll talk about what are some of these coexisting conditions besides the common ones. So what is life with ADHD like? After talking with so many folks, of course, there are some common uh, factors, some commonalities, but there are so many things that are very individual. Um, and it definitely impacts our academic life and our occupational functioning. And Dr. Hallowell will say that in order to successfully manage your ADHD in adult life, you need to have a right partner, right support system, right family environment, so your environment, and right job. Um, so if you are an adult with ADHD, absolutely find the right profession for you. Uh, Dr. Barkley says folks who have this particular condition, they do really well with things that require hands-on work or things that require practice. My favorite when I talk with my clients is um, think of uh, Adam Levine, singer, highly creative, really successful in his profession, part of Maroon 5 band. We've got Michael Phelps. Um, Olympian gold medalist, again, has ADHD, Justin Timberlake, again, super successful in his uh, celebrity life, ADHD. So life with ADHD is absolutely possible, but we recognize that, of course, there are struggles. So the struggles are academic. Um, I might not be good in English, history. I might not be good in math. So knowing where you struggle so that the plan can be made and where do you... Uh, where do you thrive? That component of strength base is so important. What are the areas? Where does your intelligence lie? If you are that mind that goes into daydreaming, can you channel it into creativity? Can you become a super successful novelist? There is difficulty in social interactions. I was talking to someone today and they said that um, absolutely hated school. They're super successful in their skill, in their trades. Um, and don't like talking to people. Social interaction is super hard for them. Last week, I was talking to someone who's a super successful salesperson. And again, it's so much on a continuum. 
you have to recognize where do I struggle? Where does my ADHD become a challenge? Is it my social anxiety that's preventing me from having social interactions? Or can I, um, like, yeah, how is it affecting me? Uh, poor organizational skills, poor time management, they all affect work performance and then they lead to job insecurity and unemployment. What really helps is early identification. More we uh, destigmatize it, more we are able to recognize that something is lacking, more we can work on developing um, skills, more we can implement behavior management. And as we put those interventions in place, academic and occupational outcomes improve significantly. And they prevent the development of more severe comorbid conditions. Um, so general overview and each individual with ADHD will, like I said, there will be some common symptoms and there will be individual stories in which individual environments and individual genetics. So we want to approach every situation with an open mind. All right, so when we prepare a psychotherapeutic plan of working with someone who has ADHD, we want to absolutely use that strength-based lens. What are the skills? What does this person, this individual already has? Is it a creative person? Like uh, Michael Phelps' parents said that we recognize that our child cannot maintain attention, but he's really good with water. He loves to swim. So we took him practice every morning and that's how he became uh, Olympian. So rather than focusing on deficits, what's missing, child doing poorly in one particular subject, what are the strengths? Where can they thrive? So if there is a diagnosis, we know the shortcomings, but what are the strengths? And how is this diagnosis presented to the child? My child absolutely hates the label, um, but I know some of children that I've talked, their doctors are so amazing and how they present it to the child that this is just a different brain. It's not a deficit. You can absolutely channel your strengths and succeed in whatever you decide to do. But it's like, can we stick to it? Can we as parents and caregivers bring in that component of external motivation and help them with, um, you know, it's like if you have a weak eyesight, can I give you the glasses, right glasses? So history needs to be taken from parents, from teachers, adult ADHD, from spouse, from colleagues, from boss, from folks in your social, um, you know, social circle. And formula for success, if you can take anything from this presentation, folks, know that your plan, your treatment plan should include connection, using that play, inviting curiosity into your life, practice, which is our repetition, which is where our behavior management comes mastering these skills and that's how you gain recognition and I'll touch on these five points continuously. Okay so when self-regulation so that is a big component that we cannot self-regulate so when self-regulation or executive functioning is a challenge we absolutely need to develop self-awareness. So after a certain point at 25 when our brain is fully developed it's on us before 25, we need our caregivers, our parents, uh, people in our social circle to assist us in developing this self-awareness and monitoring. Um, so reflection component needs to be there. As a seven-year-old, I cannot reflect, so I need my parent to talk to me, and we will touch on that in subsequent slides. There has to be a conversation and giving the tools to our children so that they can self-regulate but in order to self-regulate we need to show them what does regulation mean how can we as adults be co-regulator for folks who are struggling with that self-regulation component um, the brain is seeking thrill it's like a fast car how do we implement those brakes on this fast race car uh, visual imagery really works we have to practice mindfulness those components we need those brakes literally body brakes we need to check in what's the internal speech. When kid is getting frustrated, is the internal speech, I cannot do it, I'm not good at it, or I don't know this, but I'm going to ask my teacher for help. So what's that internal voice and what's the external support system? And how do we find balance between these two? Self-motivation is missing. Um, so again, we need those external motivators. 
there has to be a component of planning, which is front loading as caregivers, and then helping our children, our youth develop problem solving skills. Delegating is really important, as well as knowing my strengths. So common comorbid conditions and their impact on daily functioning. So like I said, 60% of individuals ADHD will have at least one comorbid condition. Um, this could be anxiety, depression, OCD, uh, bipolar could be present. And if unmanaged, high chances of developing addictions. Um, yeah, and that's where, you know, lots of fear is that if it's an attentive, inattentive brain, they will seek thrill. Uh, they want that dopamine hit. So how can we give them that dopamine hit? Is it from uh, having a successful, you know, song, a successful career, or is it going to be from maladaptive coping mechanisms? And some of the most common comorbid conditions uh, that we see, oppositional defiance, uh, conduct disorder, again, not a fan of labels. So we want to really see what's happening in this child's entire, you know, environment. How are their parents? Are parents regulated? And what supports can we give to the parents so that they can uh, support the child? Anxiety, mood, uh, feelings of sadness, hopelessness, irritability, uh, learning disorders, super common uh, along with ADHD. So current treatment options, medication management. So medication works in about 80% of the cases, a 20%, it may not work. Um, behavior management, we absolutely need to take that accountability. I have an ADHD brain. How do I use what the research says? How do I practice these skills to become good at what I do? Um, so I need to develop skills and then I need to enhance these skills. So medication is needed in about 70 to 80% cases. And the good news is that uh, if the diagnosis was done between seven to 12, 15 to 20% of folks might uh, grow out of it, but not everyone. So stimulant medications are used, Ritalin, Adderall, Concerta, they are most commonly uh, prescribed. And when we say stimulant, um, there is sometimes confusion that it's already super active child, why are you prescribing a stimulant? So stimulant is actually stimulating um, the dopamine, uh, in dopamine neurotransmitters in the brain. Uh, so they work by increasing the levels of dopamine and norepinephrine in the brain. And it helps to improve the attention and impulse control. Again, it's like putting those breaks. And then we've got non-stimulant medications and there has to be a good uh, reason why your doctor will prescribe one or the other. So that conversation with your doctor becomes super important. Why am I getting prescribed what I'm getting prescribed? And again, it's about uh, you know ensuring that you get the right dosage and right medication. And they help with inattention, impulsivity, and hyperactivity. Again, if I have weak eyesight, I need my eyeglasses. And a lot of times in, you know, school system, what we notice is teachers will say, if only you can focus, you will do so much better. I see the potential. But if I could focus, I would focus because I don't want to be yelled at. I want to have friends in the class. I don't want to be disruptive. I don't want to be called the class clown. So I need my eyeglasses to be able to function in an academic system. All right, so some of our non-management, uh, non-medication, I forgot the word medication there. So non-medication management options, again, behavior management, social skills training, uh, organizational skills, enhancing these skills, letting the parents know how to support their child, super important. I was that naive parent who thought I can take my child to psychologist and she will fix him not knowing that I have to do that heavy lifting. So if you're a parent and you have a child, uh, yes, we have to do that heavy lifting. We have to teach our children these skills. And it's not a matter of discipline. We have to bring in so much more kindness and compassion in our work with, with our children. Um, so positive reinforcement really works. Problem solving in the moment really helps. And other strategies are if internal time clock is broken, which it is in ADHD, we need external time clock because the internal is not working. 
uh, social tr skills training, how to interact with others effectively, and how to build and maintain relationships. Because in adult life, I see like a lot of folks who are struggling with relationships, there is typically that ADHD component. Um, so emotion regulation is missing. I was getting a lot of folks uh, coming in for anger management. And it turns out that many of them uh, lose control at work sites. And reason was either undiagnosed ADHD or not having those regulation skills at all. No one taught us. So organizational skills, how to manage time and space effectively, how to prioritize tasks and how to stay on track. And when we are talking about medication, I often get asked, what do you think? I'm not in favor of medication, but neither am I against. And that's because it's a very, very individual decision. We almost have to do that risk and reward analysis. Um, we have to consider what is the cost if I don't take medication. Um, I'm non-biased here, uh, not in favor, not against. If you ask a psychiatrist, many of them will say, take it. And I want to take it with a grain of salt because who is funding their paycheck, right? So of course they're gonna say, uh, take it, but it does help. I have good amount of clients who say, my medication makes a big difference. I also have folks who've said, my medication makes me loopy. So it could be a matter of adjusting the dosage or adjusting um, the kind of medication. So it can be part of the treatment plan. Um, again, qualified healthcare provider reviewing the medications on a regular basis because you can grow out of what it was doing for you uh, or you might be the lucky one. I found the right dose. I found the right medication. It's helping. Dr. Barkley will absolutely say that the teens, if you have that ADHD um, you know, diagnosis in your teenage years, don't stop taking it. You've got to get through high school in order to then succeed in your college. Um, and we have to provide feedback to our healthcare providers, letting them know if my medication is being effective or not, and the side effects. Very patient forward system. We need to let them know if the adjustment needs to be made, if I need more or less, and the side effects and symptoms and my overall functioning. And they only have six minutes to 10 minutes to talk to you. So key points written before your uh, appointments with them. And for thorough discussions, you've got professionals like us. And if you decide that you want to discontinue, again, gradual, because otherwise your brain might go into, uh, you know, unhappy mode, withdrawal symptoms. Okay. So as parents, we have to let go of the notion of the child that we wanted. We've got to love the one we've got with all their deficits. We've got to celebrate their intelligences. There are seven to eight different kind of intelligence levels. So if they're not academically smart, maybe they're really good mechanically or they're really good in creative. Uh, so finding those talents, super important. We want to encourage and reward pro-social behaviors and discouraging antisocial when and wherever possible. And that's on us as a society in general. Um, you know, I see folks out and about how parents yell at their children. It's not a discipline thing. If there is a diagnosis, we got to pre-plan. We've got to front load. We've got to be prepared for those social settings where our child might have a meltdown. Uh, neurofeedback and biofeedback techniques are gaining some recognition. They're supposed to be uh, helpful for some folks. Mindfulness and meditation techniques can be really good with that emotional regulation piece. Um, and because it's biological in nature and not social, we need that shift in our cognitive schemas. And cognition is our thinking processes. Uh, MBCT, mindfulness-based um, cognitive therapy, mindfulness-based stress reduction, they are really useful uh, psychotherapeutic plans that can help. CBT, especially if depression component is present and if anxiety is more prominent than body-based, somatic approaches. Physical activity is super important with ADHD brain, flushes out the toxins. Lots of research in last, you know, last decade and so that is saying that that's one way we can uh, definitely support this diagnosis. Physical activity is so needed. 
um, mental brain gym, there was a study that said if these mental uh, brain gym activities done 10 minutes twice a day for these 10 to 12 year old kids for six months, their attention improved significantly. Again, the data is like not enough that it's adopted by mainstream, but like Dory method has lots of success. Um, so brain gym activities, highly recommended if you have a child, youth, who needs a little bit more attention, um, attention development. And combination of different treatments, more effective than a single treatment approach. And this has to take into consideration who is this person, who is this child, what are their uh, genetic makeup like, and what is their environment like. So their lifestyle needs to be taken into consideration and what are some of the other existing things. Oh, that was a lot of background information. How's everyone doing? I hope it's not like I'm rambling on and on. I sometimes get really passionate about it because last decade of my life, my child is now 11, was focused on, you know, figuring this out because I couldn't really, you know, accept the fact that I could have a child who has this, right? So it was a lot of uh, reflecting on my own part, but feel free to move about. You can stretch your neck because um, I find sitting for two hour webinars is just too much. But if you are like, okay, no, let's keep going. Take a moment to just reflect on your own symptoms of ADHD. How does this impact you and your life? Uh, that inattention, hyperactivity, um, impulsivity. For me, uh, undiagnosed uh, ADHD, I think I just get so sidetracked. Uh, my desk is never clean. I always have so many things. But it's the passion that keeps me driving and practice and repetition. Um, so when we talk about impulsivity symptoms, I've said walk away and talk about emotions later. It's like how I prepare my child for school uh, that you're going to get in. I know he's going to get into some kind of an altercation with a friend, argument with the teacher, frustrated, um, not accepted. How do you manage that situation? It's like repetitively telling him you've got to walk away. And then we talk about his emotions so that he doesn't feel that he's being dismissed. Um, so we got to make list of situations that trigger symptoms. Large group settings. Is it large group settings that are intimidating for me? Is it when the tasks are boring or monotonous? Or is it when my environment is noise, noisy or chaotic? Because for some people, they might thrive in that chaos. It just lines perfectly with how their brain is. Or for some people, it could be too much. Um, do I get overwhelmed with multiple tasks or responsibilities? So what are my triggers? Uh, what affects me? And my plan has to work for me. And that's where that individual uh, planning is really helpful. And as parents, we have to see how do I manage and mitigate these triggers in the future? Do I need to give extra tutoring to my child? Um, how do I provide them that protection and that nurturing, uh, that shelter, that good nourishment, that love, that care, so that they don't feel that they are an outcast, so that they can be integrated into academic system, into occupational life successfully. So we have to almost shift from micromanagement more into accident prevention in pasture. And by that, I mean that as caregivers, as parents, we get to determine the pastures in which our lamb grazes. So we are not engineers. We are given this child who is like our lamb and we as adults in their lives get to determine what kind of environment to provide them. And that's where we have some influence as parents. We get to determine the pastures. We get to determine extra tutoring or social settings um, in which they are going to graze so that they are successful in their lives. I think someone is waiting to be admitted. All right, moving on. Oh. 
let's pause for a moment. I don't know what happened. Why is the screen not moving forward? Aditi, is everything okay? Try arrow keys. Yes. I'm trying. It seems like it got stuck. Um, hmm. Oh, there we go. Yes. Yeah, so after medication management, then your next step is that behavior management. We've got to figure out these strategies for organization um, and time management, um, techniques for improving attention and impulse control. And of course, that psychoeducational piece where me, as someone who has this diagnosis or as a parent, knowing what to do in order to manage this. So when it comes to organization, um, best research method are SMART goals, which is let's break down the larger task into smaller, more manageable steps. If you're thinking of climbing a mountain, you're not looking at uh, the mountain, you're not looking at mountain Mount Everest, you're just looking at grouse grind. Before grouse grind, you're just looking at that ladder in your house. How do I climb? What is my first step? So you got to divide that large task into small, manageable steps. These kids uh, in school system thrive when it's not a whole big list of entire assignment. It's like small chunk, first chapter, not the whole book. So SMART simply stands for something that is very, very specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and time-bound. If you're helping someone do an assignment as a parent, caregiver, or yourself, assignment that needs to be done, break it down into small, manageable uh, task. Using a planner or a calendar, really helpful, keeping track of those appointments. Three-year-old doesn't have appointments, but a 30-year-old does, right? So if we can set those pieces in the beginning, adult life becomes much more easy. And we don't want too many. That's what we notice. That's what Dr. Barkley said that he notices with his patients is a lot of folks will have so many apps on their phone to help them stay productive and uh, staying on track. You just need once. You don't need too many. Simplify. Simplify your life because you're already overwhelmed in your brain. So keeping track of appointments and deadlines using visual aids. So again, what kind of learner you are, visual aids really, really help children using charts and diagrams to help with that organization and breaking down. Come home from school, drop the shoes here, put the bag here, Simple steps, two or three. Can't say that you come home and expect my child to sit down and do homework, not going to happen. So breaking it down into small steps and using reminders, whether it be an alarm to stay on schedule, whether it's an app, whether it's like clean your room, like it won't work. It has to be very simple reminder. Shoes go here, plate goes there so that environment in the house stays uh, manageable. So keeping a clean and well-organized workspace, um, this is where I say that expect, expect that ADHD person's desk is going to be chaotic, accept it, and then plan, right? As a parent, I know room will not be clean. I'm going to expect that it's going to be messy. I have to accept his deficits, and then I have to plan. Sunday morning, two hours, we are cleaning. By Monday evening, it's wrecked again just being okay with it. Um, and Dr. Hallowell's best advice in order to succeed as an adult with ADHD brain, you've got to have right support system, right partner, person you're spending your life with, and the right job. And if you don't have a right job, okay enough job, because you might not find your perfect job, but am I okay in what I do? So important. So don't expect perfection from yourself, just okay enough to get by. Don't expect 100 out of 100 in every assignment, just okay enough to move on with life. Time management ideas, you need more automation. Um, cerebralum activation, if you Google cerebralum uh, activation activities, that would be really helpful. Um, so we are really working with the non-executive part of the brain because executive functioning is already um, challenged. So we have to prioritize tasks by importance. We want to shorten the delays and we are in fact getting rid of the delays. Um, so you want to be the last person who's getting on the plane so that you're minimizing the delay. Otherwise the child who's 
sitting there is squirming and crying and yelling. So think of how do we shorten the delay because brain is not good at waiting. And you want to set realistic deadlines. We want to accommodate for the deficits. We are putting structure and routine in place, which is almost like putting an artificial leg because we know there is a deficit in the brain. There is a disconnect between knowledge and performance. So breaking tasks into smaller manageable steps, using something like a timer or stopwatch, because if you're working on an assignment that's too interesting, you might forget about other uh, tasks that you need to do. So we absolutely want that Pomodoro method in place, which is you work for 15, 20 minutes, you take a five minute wait, break, again, 15, 20 minutes, five minute break. You think, okay, if I lose my, if I stop now to take that five minute break, I'm gonna lose it. But you're working that sustainability for longer, uh, for lifelong success versus just success today. Um, avoiding procrastination, which comes with ADHD. So we want to externalize time. I'm going to feel less anxious if I finish the presentation on time. Um, so as much as brain is wired to procrastinate, you want to do an action that is complete opposite. You want to be the first one to submit your assignment and assignment could be okay enough. You want accountability partner that really helps whether your goal is to exercise more or to just start exercising or to eat better, having counselor, therapist, accountability partner, parent, coach, friend, absolutely helps. For teachers, you want to give these children who have this diagnosis smaller projects, projects that they can do and projects that are well suited for their brain, not what's written in the curriculum. And of course, regular breaks. And we want to repeat, repeat, repeat. That's the third component, that practice. But before practice, we've got that connection and we've got that play. That is creativity and curiosity. Then comes the practice. And for organization and time management, looking at the time, we are right on track. Um, so what helps is... We have so much technology, but you want to simplify. You want to use one calendar that works for you that you are bound to use again and again. Uh, reminders. As much as you hate your partner or parent nagging you, you want that reminder. Um, again, a lot of uh, folks, when they go into college, they fail because there's no one to remind them. They have to manage themselves. And if that management piece was set in grade 11, grade 12, transition to college becomes easier. You want task management app, productivity app, but again, don't have 20 apps on your phone. Simplify. Pomodoro techniques, my favorite, that helps me get through work. Um, you want to play with some time management games to see what will work for you. So, so much out there, choose what works for you. And what works for your friend might not work for you. So, play around and then decide what's going to work. And then you repeat that, rinse and repeat again and again for success. How do we, how do we improve attention? For me, yoga was my savior, mindfulness, absolutely. My child, not there, he cannot do that. So body breaks works uh, for him. Uh, lots of self-talk that is positive. How do we talk to ourselves? Is Am I telling myself I'm lazy, um, I cannot get things done, or am I celebrating my wins? And more we have these positive cognitions growing up, easier it becomes in early adulthood, easier in later adult life. And sometimes self-talk is like, I'm going to forget. So I'm telling myself, I'm getting up right now, I'm going to the kitchen to grab a glass of water. Um, otherwise, that halfway down the hallway, what, what was I going to do might happen. So written reminder, rather it's my sheet that says 12 o'clock lunch break, so much needed, or I might forget. So use self-talk to manage your attention. Um, and also for children, you want to use reward method, positive reinforcement, and when then. When this happens, then you're going to do this. When Miss... So and so says this to me, then I'm going to do this. So when, then, which is our pre-planning, which is our front loading, which absolutely helps train the brain again and again. 
visualization, creating image in your mind when you are submitting that assignment. How will you feel? What will that look like? So latching onto that hope, what I want to achieve, and I just need to be okay enough to get through this semester to proceed to the next one. Uh, this quarter, managing my sales for this quarter to get to the next one. And again, no denying the fact that physical exercise is so beneficial. Regular physical exercise is going to help improve focus and attention by increasing blood flow to the brain and releasing chemicals that improve your mood and cognitive function. So you're less dependent on medication. And then you will gradually decrease it with the help of your uh, GP. So when we are working with someone, we want individualized therapy sessions. They can be solution focused or they could be emotion focused. What do we want to do with all these emotions that come when I'm told I have this deficit or the cognition? I'm not good enough, um, that, that particular cognition. Then we want to focus on our impulse control techniques, counting in my head, 10 before I respond so I can develop response flexibility as opposed to reactivity. So self-monitoring um, awareness, being aware of our behavior, thoughts, and emotions. And that's where our CBT model works beautifully. That can help us better manage our impulses. And then knowing that because I have this brain, uh, I will get into fights. And then do I have... Uh, awareness enough to take accountability. And we are doing everything with so much grace and gratitude, working with children. You don't want to lose your control as a parent, caregiver. You have to be um, self-regulated so you can co-regulate them. Because if they are doing something that they're not supposed to do, you are going to get dysregulated. They are gaming instead of doing their homework. You are going to be super upset, except, except Back, they will be gaming when you get home, accept it, and then plan for it. How are you going to deal with it? Um, as your brain develops, you can talk about consequences. Um, you know, if I don't take the trash out, my partner is going to be mad. Do I want to deal with that? Um, or am I better off taking the trash out and then not worrying about their emotion because my work is done now? And that repetition will help me set this as a habit that will then help me manage my uh, everyday life. So delay of gratification, this is interesting. That's where the deficit is. Resisting temptation um, and thinking before acting, which requires lots of response flexibility, lots of work with our brain, um, that CBT approach, as opposed to reactivity. Or EFT approach where we are really focusing on the emotion. What am I feeling and how do I manage this emotion? So um, it serves me as opposed to it showing up again and again, whether it's anger, frustration, disappointment, um, and other things. Abandonment, no one helped me versus, you know, now that I'm an adult or I'm 18, 19, 20 year old, I know this is the deficit and I'm going to figure out a way to get the help that I need. Um, to be thriving in my life as opposed to just surviving. So positive self-talk, affirmations, um, focus on the cognitions. How are you talking to yourself? Are you being critical? Are you being too hard on yourself? Are you telling yourself you're lazy? Um, are you getting bored and saying, I'm not interested? Or are you trying to be creative to find a solution to your uh, problem? Whose help can I solicit to finish this assignment, uh, this project? or this task. And again, you have to be okay enough. And we want to clear our mind of distractions. So focus for five minutes. And then when you can focus for five, then you increase it to 15, step by step, one day at a time, one step at a time. So when we work with the parents, we want to uh, focus on overlearning. You want to you know, your child needs to overlearn and over practice. So it becomes a habit, but how you do it is super important so that you're not a nag, you are a support system. So inviting that compassion um, in your work with children, whether you are in academic, whether you are an educator, teacher, or a parent. Positive reinforcement works. Disciplining, being hard doesn't work. Um, so you want to use 
problem solving, identifying what is going to be problem. You're going to forget your lunch. I told you I'm going to work. Your lunch is on the counter. You might forget it. And if you do, are you going to ask your teacher to give you an extra granola bar from uh, her desk? Or are you going to share lunch with a friend? Or does school has something? Then this becomes a problem. And how do we find solutions? Do I just give school extra box of food for my child to keep just in case my child forgets it? That's on us to uh, figure out. Communication skills. So if you are a parent, get to know your child's teacher. So important. Uh, and you want to become their friends before you demand. Demand that my child should be treated this way. Um, so you want to communicate effectively with your child's support system as well as how you're communicating with your child and with other adults in the child's life. Grandparents, uh, parents of their friends, so important. Don't come from defense place, come from a place of let me educate them how my child functions. Uh, anger management, again, I need to regulate my emotions so I can teach my child. I can't expect my child to regulate their emotions if I can't manage my own. So responding appropriately. If I have response flexibility, I can then give it to uh, folks I work with. But if I'm not regulated myself, I can't, I can't, um, you know, support someone else. So I have to have my own journey um, as a parent, as an adult, as a caregiver to support someone in my life who has ADHD. And I need to manage my own stress, take care of my own emotional well-being to support others. Okay, and that's the parenting component. So if you're taking medication, there could be side effects and these Side effects could be uh, with stimulants, insomnia, loss of appetite, stomachache, headache, nervousness. So, ex so expect something can go wrong, accept it, and then decide cost versus risk. Do I continue taking the medication? Do I switch? Do I lower the dosage? Do I ask for more? Um, or maybe going for non-stimulants, which comes with drowsiness, fatigue, nausea, dizziness, dry mouth. Uh, so that continuous conversation with uh, healthcare providers and our system is broken. You might have to wait three weeks before you get to see uh, your GP. All right. So considerations when we are monitoring the effectiveness. Change in weight is so, uh, you know, children tend to put on weight on certain medications. So watch for that. Um, you want to notice the mood change, what's going on mentally, emotionally. So is it just because of the medication or are there other environmental factors? And where I will say that if you have a child who is neurodiverse, there is so much bullying, so much victimization, you want to really watch out for that. And both ways, if your child is doing to others or uh, if the child is being too aggressive, watch for that. And adults, you want to watch for cardiovascular health with stimulant medications, increase in blood pressure and heart rate, and bringing these concerns up as they occur. Collaboration, super important um, between your healthcare providers, as well as talking to psychologists, therapists, uh, behavior interventionists, school counselors, social workers, case managers, making sure they are coordinating with each other. And holistic approach, that's what I like. Okay, so if you have ADHD, remember, don't try to get good at what you are bad at. Instead, try to get better at what you are good at. I'll give you a moment to digest that. So it's like you really want to know whether you're a fish or a monkey or a rabbit. And once you figure that out, if you are a fish, don't try to get good at jumping, climbing, going from tree to tree. And if you're a monkey, don't try to get good at swimming because that's not your skill. You just have to be okay enough to get through the school academics, but then you want to really get better at what you're good at so that you can build your confidence, your self-esteem, so you can start to uh, thrive in your life. So executive functioning skills, we know that's a great deficit. Um, what are some of these strategies? How do we work on that? How do we work on our decision-making? And how do we manage our anxiety and stress and build our 
resilience. I'll just touch on a few things here. So executive functioning is basically set of cognitive skills that are responsible for planning, organizing, organizing and managing our daily activities. And these skills include like our attention, working memory, cognitive flexibility, control of our inhibitions, planning and organization. And executive functioning improves our daily life and it helps us complete tasks. And these are all the deficits, but we are coming from strength based. So what are these strengths? And how do we compensate for this? Because of these deficits, there are going to be uh, difficulty with tasks, time management, prioritization, following through on plans. Um, yeah, some of these folks will cancel the plans last minute. I might say, yes, I'm so excited then I'm demotivated. I'm not coming to the party. And I can't think what my friend is going to feel because I'm, caught up in my own head, I don't have that, you know, uh, lens to think of the others. And that's where my EFT training will help me. Okay, difficulties in academics, occupations, social and emotional problems, relationship problems, super common uh, as we become adults. And how are we going to support that? We are going to talk less. We're going to touch more. For my child, because he has SPD2, what I find really helps was that heavy weighted blanket uh, swing, that back and forth where there is um, you know, just going back and forth really helps, which is from again, OT, but also soothing. Soothing happens when we move, bilateral uh, movement and hugs, you know, just, just being present sometimes. Might not work all the time if he's dysregulated and might have to remove myself, protect myself, but just letting him know that I'm here and I love you regardless of your diagnosis is super important um, for folks who have um, mental challenges to know that you're loved. So some strategies we need, we use behavior management. Again, medication might be needed. Psychoeducation of the parents, OT help really helps. Uh, neurofeedback might help and then mindfulness based interventions where we are really slowing down and applying brakes to our race car brain and then no, finding which strategies are going to work for me is it a motivation um, motivation is my issue or is it time management is it organization do I just need to get through school or do, do I need to get through this project and then find a better job so it's like where is my challenge and how do I compensate for it using the strengths that I have? Okay, we want to get rid of ridicule and fear. That's the big thing. People don't understand it. General public, child is lazy, child is not disciplined, no one is paying attention. We are actually paying a lot of attention. Um, and that's where we want to go. We want to remove that fear because these kids can succeed. We, um, as folks with ADHD, we can do well in our lives. Example, my favorite, Dr. Hallowell, he become, became an MD. He was uh, English and uh, history uh, grad, and then he went to uh, medical school, my role model, one of my role models. Um, so we want to apply external limits to dangerous impulses because these people sometimes with neurodiverse brain, they are thrill seeking. They don't have enough dopamine. I want an external source, uh, especially in teenage years. We really want to watch... Um, we want to use research, we want to learn from research, and we want to learn from our past experiences. We want to transform unmanageable chaos into manageable chaos or manageable enough, um, whether that could mean as an adult hiring cleaner, accountant, if I can pay my bills, um, teaching our children these skills and learning these skills ourselves as adults, and then accepting, accepting our shortcomings, playing with our strengths working in small spurts rather than big chunks and tapping into our intuition because some of uh, neurodiverse folks are highly creative empaths um, tapping into that intuition that courage that creativity and then how do we plan and problem solve and decision make um, because these are so needed uh, to set goals to create plans and to actually achieve plans so break down larger chunks into small manageable steps, 
prioritize tasks based on importance and urgency. Um, five minutes before you get go to bed, dump out everything on a piece of paper. Um, or when you get up in the morning, your engine might be at full throttle or car might not start. Uh, and if engine is at full throttle, so much to do, I'm already overwhelmed. Analysis, paralysis, what I'm going to do, and then nothing gets done. So we definitely want to plan for it. <clears throat> what happens for me when I get up in the morning and how am I going to deal with it? I already have a plan. I'm going with a roadmap, with a plan, rather than trying to think in the moment because that might not happen. And we want to schedule time for specific tasks so we can manage our everyday life. We want to use visual aids, calendars, to-do lists. We want to create a plan and then we want to adjust the plan. So plan A, B, C. And these strategies might help us uh, get through our everyday life. And then we get good at it because we are repeating it again and again. Um, so when we are trying to use the executive functioning where decision-making is affected, we want to actually write it down. That works for me and that works for a lot of folks. Um, and it's the process of choosing between different options. Sometimes talking helps. Um, sometimes that could be re-triggering, re-traumatizing. That might remind me of all the times when I have failed in my life. And when I write it down, um, then I'm not stuck in my head. I'm not in my cognition. I'm not in analysis paralysis. I have a concrete plan. How am I going to get where I'm going? Um, sharing it with someone helps. Sharing it with uh, my accountability partner, uh, someone who's keeping me on track is helpful. You are doing this with your child so that they can stay on track. Don't leave it on them. They cannot do it. So you are doing the heavy, heavy lifting. Uh, we want to identify the options. We want to gather as much information as possible. What are the possibilities? Evaluating pros and cons. Do I take medication? Do I not take medication? Risk versus reward. What is important for me? What are my values? And then choosing the best option and then implementing that decision. Right. So techniques for building resilience and coping with anxiety, especially I have to go back to uh, school and everything that comes with that you want to. So resilience is basically your ability to adapt and bounce back from stress and adversity. So you want to really think of your personal strengths. We go after this presentation and make a big list of everything you are good at. Um, for me, it was my hard work. I think that got me through school. Might not be the sharpest kid in the class, but definitely gonna work hard until I get to where I'm going. So identify and utilize your strengths, area of your life that is affected because of your deficits and how are you going to manage it? Uh, what have you learned from your past failures and how are you going to get the support that you need? You want to build a supportive network of friends, family and professionals and people who are toxic, family members, you might have to distance yourself from them. You want to set realistic goals and develop a sense of purpose. Um, you want to tell your brain, this is what you're good at. And then you want to learn and practice those techniques for your anxiety. You want to seek reassurance that I can get through it. Um, and it's when you're feeling sunny, when you're feeling hopeful that you're preparing for the storm. You want to maintain a positive attitude and perspective. You're banking on research and data and evidence that folks who have this diagnosis have succeeded and so will I. It's going to be difficult, but we can do this together. So to manage your stress and anxiety, relaxation, deep breathing, connect with nature, go for walks, exercise, um, use the apps that help. Write it down, have a calendar, tap into CBT, uh, journal, talk to a therapist, make it a habit. Um, you know, you don't have to sit and just pray for hours and hours. Just have to take one or two minute break. You want to build your problem solving capacity. You want to avoid unnecessary stress. Don't commit to too many things, only what you can handle. Um, accept that things might not change. So what is within your control? What can you change? Uh, being assertive, learning to say no, setting up boundaries, high level of self-care. 
um, and seeking professional help as needed if needed. Social skills, we've talked about a lot of them, but we'll just touch on them quickly. I'm looking at uh, time as well. I want to get to your questions. Um, anything that you want to bring up? So again, deficits in social skills. We want strategies to improve our social interactions and communication. We want to find our tribe. Who do I gel with? Who gets me? Who knows that I have neurodiverse brain and uh, can work with me? And we want those techniques for managing emotions and building self-esteem. That's so important. Um, so a lot of Dr. Barkley's research says that, um, again, that laziness, I'm lazy, I'm not good enough. Um, sometimes, you know, when I'm being yelled at all the time, I feel that no one loves me. So how do we make sure that those cognitions don't develop in the child? Or child who feels that there's so much pressure, everyone is loving me so much, they're doing so much for me, I'm getting tutoring, I'm being put into so many activities, and I'm still uh, struggling to manage my day to day. So we want to really pay attention um, what's happening for the child. Do they need so many activities or one or two things that they're really interested in is all that is needed for them to you know, get through this phase of their life. So the deficit is sometimes we don't understand those social cues, nonverbal communication. And it's not that we are not paying attention. Sometimes there's so much stimulus, so many things that demand my attention. So I'm not paying attention to what teacher is saying. Um, I don't engage in conversation because I get bored. I cannot sustain attention or I cannot maintain eye contact. And sometimes there is another component of maybe Asperger's or autism or learning disabilities that could be affecting. So it might not just be ADHD. Uh, re reading and responding to emotions of others can be difficult. Waiting is very hard. So taking turns in conversation is challenging. And then knowing how to manage emotions and regulating behavior in social situations. So it's like learning a skill, not just, uh, you know, adapting, not putting on a mask, but actually knowing how to behave. And then that becomes, you know, who we are. Because if I'm only pretending that I'm interested when I'm not, that's not going to serve you or me, not going to help our friendship. Um, so impact on daily life, uh, struggles with making friends, maintaining, maintaining relationships and working on projects. Collaboration is very difficult. So then you might have to work, uh, find a job where you are doing work on your own and not working on a team group project. Following social rules is hard and conventions. And sometimes if you get the rule and others don't follow it, you get upset and frustrated. So how do we navigate? Um, understanding sarcasm and irony can be difficult sometimes. And because of all these things, I feel lonely. I don't have enough confidence, poor self-esteem. I might develop phobias, OCD. Um, and I might have other emotional and psychological problems, but there is help we can overcome this. And that is social skills training, role-playing exercises, mindfulness-based interventions, brain gym, uh, my favorite. That's what I try to do with my child sometimes, uh, some of those activities. And these activities are very fun. It's like, you know, with one hand, you're drawing a circle. With the other, you're trying to do the triangle. Then you're improving the time that it takes you to do those. Um, they help. And as parents, we are learning managing our own emotions so that we can support the others. So our own self-care is top-notch. And what strategies are going to work for you, for your family, for your child, for you as an um, adult? And then you make a plan based on this. So if I would, if I could, I would. So it's not that I don't want to attend to our conversation. If I could, I totally would, but I just can't. I don't want to squint um, because that's not how weak eyesight works. So I need my glasses. So right kind of glasses, right um, you know, prescription. If I my eyesight needs minus one, I cannot wear minus three. And our social interaction strategy is that connection, play, practice, master, and then you gain recognition because that's going to help my uh, confidence. So in small doses, I'm learning to understand social cues. I'm developing my active listening skills and I'm finding this balance in my life. 
uh, non-verbal communication, what feels safe to me? Is this teacher already angry, going to be mad at me, or is this teacher going to understand me? Um, then I practice. I practice conversation skills, asking for what I need, understanding and interpreting those social cues, and then managing my emotions. I need to know what I feel so that I can make sense of what's happening in my life. I want to label my emotions. I want to know them. I want to then process them. And this helps. So know what works for you in social settings, what works for your child and what doesn't. So pre-planning is so needed for our children, for our youth. Um, so ADHD brain is moving continuously from one crisis to the others. We want to look ahead. We want to anticipate something's going to go wrong and we want to plan. And that's why insurance companies do so well because they are feeding off the fear, but we want to feed off our strengths, um, our courage and the data. Uh, my child is going to forget his lunch. He's going to forget his uh, assignment. He might not do it. So I need to be on top to help him with his homework. We want to find those opportunities to play and connect. We want to be creative. And then we want to practice giving them our undivided attention. And our effective communication strategies include developing those verbal and written language skills. If skills are deficit, tutoring, extra support after school, improving our listening skills, listening for their what they're telling us and what they're not telling us, interpreting nonverbal cues, um, regulating behaviors, teaching them, uh, self-regulation by showing them co-regulation, appropriate tone of voice and body language. So we want to really show them. We cannot tell them that you need to stay calm. We have to show them how to stay calm. And we want to give guidance at the time of performance, uh, especially younger the brain, more we want to guide when the performance is happening then and there versus late because um, there is this concept of swift justice. They cannot interpret it later. What are you talking about? I've already forgotten. I've already moved on. And now you bring it up. It doesn't work like that. So when we look at strategies for improving uh, social interactions, you want to identify the problem and you want to find the goal. What's the goal? And when we work with folks who have ADHD, we want to definitely focus on the goal. Goal for the session, goal for uh, their interaction with us. And then we want to generate potential solutions, evaluating pros and cons, selecting the best solution, and then implementing the solution, knowing that there will be roadblocks, but we have a plan for that. Um, assertive communication, and then managing emotions and regulating behavior during conflict. So conflict management. You don't, as a parent, you don't want to engage the conflict. You want to, because you're not going to win or you're going to get tired and frustrated, which you don't want. So you really want to avoid um, that. You want to co-regulate. You want to regulate yourself so that there's no scope for conflict, but conversation and connection. So emotion uh, management is the process of regulating one's emotions to feel good. I need evidence of good things I've done. Uh, so my successes should be praised by my parent so that it helps my confidence. And effective emotion management, recognizing and understanding one's emotions. Um, so child is frustrated instead of saying, uh, you know, instead of giving them advice, you really want to emotionally tune to what's happening for the child. They are frustrated. So just saying, are you frustrated? Are you sad today? What are you feeling? So if they're angry and yelling and you say, oh, looks like you're angry. They're like, no, I'm not, right? So it's like very interesting, but the tone of voice is showing that they are angry. So sometimes you're silent. Sometimes you're just there. Sometimes you're just present uh, to help them through what they're feeling. So relaxation techniques, doing them together as a family or creating the environment where we can all breathe together. We can slow down, identifying the triggers as well as glimmers of hope. Uh, Again, that's the strength. What is working and how do we enhance that that's working? CBT and EFT are great. And mindfulness apps like uh, Headspace, uh, Calm, they can be really useful too. How do you build your self-esteem? Which gets affected? Which brings on low self-esteem? Which brings uh, anxiety? You want really 
enhancing their confidence, distilling the confidence, um, enhancing their sense of self-worth, self-acceptance. So if we accept them, children start accepting themselves. And lower self-esteem is due to social difficulties, academic difficulties, occupational challenges, negative feedback from others. Um, so with a lot of my folks in their um, adult life, if they're receiving a feedback from the boss and boss is critical, I ask them, like, ask your boss, what am I doing well? Because you're receiving all this critical feedback and that's impacting your confidence. You don't want to go to work. So ask the boss, what am I doing well? So seek uh, that reassurance. And again, that internal dialogue, am I telling myself I'm a failure or am I telling myself, okay, I don't know this. Um, I'm going to practice till I master it or manageable enough. So I want to know my strengths inside out. I want to set those realistic and, realistic and achievable goals. I want to engage in activities that I enjoy so that that mastery can happen. I really enjoy, say, playing violin or piano, or I really enjoy math, or I really enjoy um, fun particular thing, basketball. I want to really enhance that, but again, in balance, because I have to live my life. Uh, learning to accept compliments and positive feedback, practicing positive self-talk, affirmations, and seeking professional help as needed. So right occupation um, is so important. Enhancing self-care is important, uh, getting enough sleep, healthy diet. So with the diet component, omega-3s and uh, spirulina, some evidence is coming out that they are really help, uh, they really help the ADHD brain. Regular physical activities, relaxation techniques, setting boundaries, finding a form of creative expression and having that solid supportive network. And when self-care is top-notch, then you feel good overall. That helps your self-esteem and your resilience. Okay, so just summarizing. It's a motivational uh, disorder. Addictive behaviors can be really high. So we need that preemptive problem solving. Um, neurodevelopmentally, we know there are symptoms of inattention, could be hyperactivity or may not be there. Uh, motivation is impacted impact on daily life academically, occupationally, and combination of genetics and environmental factors. And there is a disconnect between knowledge and performance. What helps? Medication and behavior therapy, medication, stimulants or non-stimulants, behavior therapy, psychoeducation of your parents, colleagues, partner, development of social skills, CBT to challenge negative cognitions, solutions to live our everyday life effectively, interpersonal EFT skills to manage our emotions. So be proactive, not reactive. You as a parent, as well as if you are someone who has this uh, diagnosis, be proactive. When you have good days, that's when you prepare for the bad days. That's where you prepare a plan and then remind yourself, plan may not work so you have a backup plan um, throughout the task you are seeking feedback or if you're a parent educator throughout the task you are giving feedback we want to follow the roadmap we want to keep it short whether it's instruction that we are giving uh, reprimand or praise you can highlight the praise um, so again it's tough it's tough being a parent or a partner uh, to someone who has ADHD so you have to do heavy lifting but remember this works beautifully, so much research behind it. Pieces of connection, play, practice, mastery, and uh, gaining recognition. So again, you want to forgive yourself when you yell at your child, and you want to forgive your child when they make mistakes. Because if they could, they would pay attention. If they could keep their room clean, they would keep their room clean because they don't want you to yell at them. Um, take accountability when you make mistakes. Um, develop compassion make accommodations, prioritize what is important right now, um, have tools to calm yourself down and plan for transitions. Okay, how are we doing with time? Uh, right on track, I had just prepared a case if we wanted to talk about it, but we'll keep moving along. For example, Samantha, if she's 15 year old and struggling with ADHD, 
staying organized and completing tasks. When we think about it, when we reflect on it, we might be able to see how um, you know, our own situation uh, affects this and how we can manage this. So she forgets, Samantha is forgetting to turn in assignments, trouble keeping track of her due dates, and she's falling behind in school and this is affecting her grades. So she needs that accountability partner, whether it's a best friend, whether it's a parent, whether it's a tutor, uh, using some kind of a planner or calendar. We cannot expect her to do this because we know there is a deficit in the brain. Um, reminders on phone or computer, um, breaking larger assignments into smaller tasks, knowing the due dates, which assignment is due first, collaborating with the teachers, establishing a system of checks, working with a study group, uh, and then seeking support for emotional and psychological issues. So ongoing treatment, guys, it's like you have a car that needs an oil change. Similarly, you want to keep up with your appointments, with your healthcare providers, mental health providers, with your doctor. Um, medication might be working today. It might, working, uh, might stop working tomorrow. So uh, stay on top of everything. Support groups are great so that you don't feel alone. Um, they can be valuable resource. You might get ideas by having conversations with others. And they provide a safe and supportive environment because someone else gets you and they can share what works from them and we might learn from their experience and we might get that emotional support. Educate yourself, educate others uh, about your child if your child has this diagnosis. Um, and individuals with ADHD can benefit from self-help and coping strategies, time management skills, exercise, sleep hygiene, health diet, healthy diet, therapy. So distraction that is adaptive versus maladaptive. Thrill seeking that is again, more regulated versus non-regulated. Maintenance plan is needed. So regular follow-up appointments, ongoing therapy, self-help, coping strategies, uh, support groups, collaboration with other support systems and continuously monitoring what's happening in your life. Because again, if you are investing in this, you can be successful in your everyday life and that will enhance your confidence. And then you are thriving as opposed to just surviving, just living with this condition. So personalized action plan, because strategies that work for me might not work for you. Strategies that work for one child might not work for the other. Uh, so assessing the current symptoms, how is your diagnosis impacting you? What are your strengths and weaknesses? For example, if you find it difficult to stay organized, hire an organizer. If you cannot keep your room house clean, hire a cleaner. Recognize, are you good with your hands? Are you good with memory? Where is your intelligence? Use smart goals to your advantage. Uh, develop targeted strategies for achieving your goals. For example, if your goal is to reduce interruptions, strategies could include counting the number of times you interrupt others and then setting a timer to remind yourself to wait before speaking. Um, and again, this will become easy as your brain matures. And we practice active listening. Action plan, monitoring the plan, and then reflecting on your successes so far. So some of the materials that I use uh, for this creation, my favorite is Dr. Hallowell's work and Dr. Barclay's work, um, but there are lots of books out there, um, tons and tons of resources. Again, ADHD, autism, they are more well-known um, disorders and more support, more awareness around them. Yeah, we always put things on our social media. So check out our blog. I've got ebook on my just to reduce stress. You can look at look at that as well. And we are very much so on time. I'm gonna stop sharing. Um, but to welcome any questions. You know, this is, so there is a question I was asking, is there a link between early childhood abuse and developing ADHD? It's a little bit gray. 
um, because of the abuse, there could be, is the abuse happening because the child has ADHD? That would be my question. That's what I want to know. So what we do know is that ADHD <clears throat> is less social because trauma is very much social. ADHD more um, biological. Is there an intersection? There could be. Um, but again, it's it's very gray. If we look at clinically, they will say no because inattention is already there. Um, it can be enhanced though. For example, someone might have a gene that causes inattention, but that gene never got developed because the environment was so perfect. Their pasture was amazing. Anyone else have any other questions? And if I don't know the answer to your question, I will absolutely look at it. I will look at the research. What are the experts saying? And then go from there. And we just touched briefly, um, but there's so much information and so many ways we can, uh, you know, manage it. <clears throat> 